All right, hello everyone. Whether you're here at the Mesa Lab or joining us virtually, thank you for sharing your time with us today for the National Science Foundation, National Center for Atmospheric Research Explorer Series lecture, When the Lobsters March North from Complex Models to Collaborative Solutions to Save America's Coral Reef. And today with us we have Dr. Kelly Dunning, and I'm Elizabeth Mays, and I'm a science education specialist here at the National Science Foundation National Center for Atmospheric Research. NSF NCAR is a world-leading organization dedicated to understanding Earth system science, which includes our atmosphere, weather, climate, the sun, and the importance of all of these systems to our society. And I'm so glad you are all joining us today to learn more about how scientists, such as Kelly, are working together with local communities to address and adapt to the impacts of climate change on coral reefs in Florida. So for this event, you'll be able to ask Kelly questions following the lecture. If you're in person, you can raise your hand and Aaliyah will come around with a microphone and give you time to ask your question. If you're joining us virtually, please ask your question using the Slido platform. If you scroll down on the webpage that you're watching this on, you can see the Slido window just below where you're seeing the live stream video of this event. And if you have not already, please go ahead and click on the green join event button and then you can ask, click on the question and answer Q&A tab. So Kelly also has a few poll questions for us to make this interactive. So for both our in-person and virtual audiences, you can respond on Slido. For those in person, you can use your phone or laptop to navigate to slido.com and enter the code hashtag explorer series or scan the QR code, which is located here. This event is also being recorded and will be available on the NSF NCAR Explorer Series website. So with us today, we have Dr. Kelly Dunning. Dr. Kelly Dunning is the Timberline Professor of Sustainable Outdoor Recreation and Tourism at the University of Wyoming Hobb School of Natural Resources and Environment. Kelly holds a PhD from MIT in Natural Resources Policy, a master's from Oxford University in Environmental Policy, and a bachelor's from the University of Florida. Before coming to academia, she taught middle school for two years in low-income schools through the Teach for America program. She, she leads the Wildlife and Wilderness Recreation Lab, and her research focuses on conservation policy in places where tourism is an important part of local identity. Kelly looks at climate vulnerable ecosystems, such as coral reefs, that are popular among tourists and determines the best management policies for biodiversity and livelihoods. Dr. Dunning is an affiliate scientist at NSF NCAR, an NSF NCAR Early Career Faculty Innovator Seed Funding Awardee, a National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine Early Career Fellow, and has received funding from places such as the National Science Foundation. Prior to leading her lab at Wyoming, she ran the Conservation Governance Lab at Auburn University. Kelly is interested in diversifying conservation and is active in the minorities in agriculture, natural resources, and related science program. She also manages the Green to Green program in her lab that trains and mentors veterans for careers in conservation. So now before I turn it over to Kelly, let's check in on your thoughts about coral reefs on our word cloud. So Joy and Nick, could you please share that slide with us? So we asked you, what do you think of when you see coral reefs? We can uh, take a look at that answer. Good. The suspense is building. Kelly can't wait to hear your answers. So Kelly, I will turn it over to you and you can give us some thoughts on our word cloud. Okay, good. Microphone? Good, okay. Well, ah, this is such a good job, Finding Nemo. I was hoping somebody would say Finding Nemo. Uh, destruction, unfortunately. Nailed it, dead, yeah. 
some folks have been to the reefs in Florida. Um, but you know, more than anything, I think that the unifying and uh, shared experience that we have on reefs is the beauty, the colors. Um, you know, there's just nothing that really compares to floating over a coral reef. And I think this encapsulates the good and the bad. And, um, you know, I hope today, before I get into the talk, you know, we don't want to leave on this note of dead and destruction, even though that's very much the case on reefs today. But we want to leave kind of walking away with some ideas of how we can help and what we can do and how we can make sure reefs are here for our children and grandchildren. So um, thank you for this. I'll keep a copy of this and put it in my office. I think y'all did a really good job. OK, um, so that was a really nice introduction. Thank you so much. Um, again, my name is Kelly Dunning. If you want to get in touch with me, you can write me an email. You can tweet at me. Anything that I could do for you, I'm at your service. Um, I'm the Timberline Professor at the University of Wyoming. And like um, Elizabeth said, I'm here to talk to you today about coral reefs and how we can use some of the tools that they're working on here at the NSF NCAR Mesa Lab to improve the way that we protect coral reefs. Um, I'll give a little bit of background. I know that y'all already had a really nice intro, but um, just to kind of put my work in context, um, I went to MIT for my doctorate. I knew some of the NCAR scientists while I was there. So some of us have been working together for quite a while at this point. Um, I have two books out. If you are interested in reading them, I'll send you a free PDF. They're academic books, so they're kind of, you know, a little on the pricier side. But I'll send you the PDF, and you can kind of look through them on your own if you're interested in that sort of thing. Um, I focus on two things in my lab. Like, my whole life's work has been really focused on how to craft public policy with a scientific impact, and then working with marginalized communities to um, build capacity to protect fragile ecosystems. Before I joined as university faculty, I worked in the five countries of the Congo Basin. I was working with indigenous communities, Baka, Bayaka communities, to um, do collaborative mapping so that we could map um, resources in the rainforest down there, second largest rainforest in the world, um, so that mining companies can't come in and kind of take this traditionally held land. And then before that, uh, like Elizabeth mentioned, I'm, I was a middle school teacher with Teach for America in Washington, D.C. So um, if there are any K-12 teachers in the room, I would love to talk to you about ways that we can maybe bring coral reefs into your classroom, because I miss it. I miss the, the kids. And then this is my lab, the Wildlife and Wilderness Recreation Lab. Um, I founded my lab in 2019, moved it from Auburn over to Wyoming. Um, and again, we focus on public policy that encourages good management of public lands, wildlife tourism, and wildlife management. Um, my lab would not be what it is today without my students. Um, they're all dedicated to public service. They go on and work in public service. Um, very popular place for folks that did the Peace Corps or folks that served in the military to come after they've given their public service and uh, hone in on their careers and then go on to their next location. So we're always looking for service-minded individuals. And if you know someone looking for a PhD, we're going to be recruiting for a funded PhD soon. So get in touch. Um, so I think we have a quiz question. Am I wrong on that? OK, all right. <laughs> um, before I get into the rest of the talk, um, I wanted to name and thank the people who I work with. Um, science, it really takes a team. It's not just me. Um, and sometimes it's a pretty big team. And there's a really big range of expertise of folks on the team. So um, one of the things that I like the most about working here at NCAR is there is a really wide range of expertise. So you can work with oceanographers, you can work with physicists, you can work with modelers, you can work with ecologists, biologists. Um, and then I have one of my grad students on here too, ex-grad student who now works in the White River National Forest. Um, he was an Air Force officer for about 10 years and used that logistics experience from his service to come and manage this big team of interdisciplinary diverse scientists. So I want to thank everybody on this team um, but also kind of differentiate myself from the team because the folks who worked on this project with me, they're natural scientists that work here at NCAR. I'm a visiting scientist and I'm a social scientist. So I work on the things that people think and do. And we're trying to blend these two disciplines to better understand how we can look after natural resources. All right. So here we 
have um, a question. This is where we're going to pull up that poll, that first poll question um, from the Slido, because Kelly, the audience is curious um, if they were correct, if their trivia knowledge is right, of what percentage of the ocean's organisms do coral reefs support? Wow. This is a really, this is a really uh, accurate group of folks here. <laughs> yes, a quarter of all marine organisms live on the coral reef. And that's a really interesting number because coral reefs cover only about 1% of the seafloor. So you're looking at a really tiny area, but a quarter of all marine organisms are on these reefs. And um, you guys knew that. Very impressive. <laughs> so do I move through the slide or do you move through the slide? or? Um, you so do. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, so why are coral reefs so important? Well, first and foremost, the biodiversity. You guys are very familiar with biodiversity. You even answered the percentage of animals in the ocean that live on reefs. Um, and like I said, even though there's so many species, and a lot of species, you know, like the coral organism itself or things that we can't see, are invertebrates. Um, so it's not just the beautiful fish and these like really charismatic species that we all love, like sea turtles, manatees. My favorite reef species is the Goliath grouper, um, very iconic, massive. It can get up to about a ton, size of a car. Um, but you know, after the talk, I would love to hear some of your favorite species. But you know, a lot of that numerical uh, weight that coral reefs pack comes in these little tiny species that you can't really see. Um, and where I'm from, we have one of the best tiny little critters diving spaces in all the world. It's called the Blue Heron Bridge. So if you're ever down in South Florida and you want to really pay attention to the unsung heroes, the little things on the reef, Blue Heron Bridge. Um, coral reefs are loved by tourists. They're a poster child for ecotourism. People come from all over the world to dive, snorkel, and hang out on Florida reefs. 70 million trips are made to coral reefs each year. They create about $36 billion in tourism revenue. $20 billion alone comes from diving and snorkeling tourism. And then people like my family have made a living in the fisheries and diving that comes along with this sort of thing. So we have um, commercial lobstermen going back um, 100 years in my family. So it's a very um, strong part of who we are and. Um, by show of hands, who here has been diving in the Florida Keys? Quite a few of you, that's great. Um, who here has fished for lobster in the Florida Keys? Awesome, okay, cool. All right. I have that there's a, a question here, is that correct? <laughs> I think I numbered my questions wrong. No, you, you got it. Okay, good. <laughs> Okay, so what are coral reefs responsible for? Um, this was a trick question. It's responsible for all these things. So really what we were polling here was, what's the thing that you're interested in? Um, I'll give you the thing that I'm interested in. It's Jimmy Buffett's band's name, rest in peace. Um, you know, the mayor of South Florida. Uh, you know, um, but all these things are really, um, really critical parts of not just what makes reefs important, but it's why we love them, right? All these really interesting, cool animals that you see on the reef. Um, the fact that a coral reef, if it's healthy and vibrant, um, is the best barrier against things like flooding and hurricanes. Inch for inch, um, you know, if we try to rebuild this type of coastal protection, it costs like 100 times as much as it does to just put some policies in place to protect the reef. So it's best to just keep the reefs healthy because they protect our condos and homes and stuff. Uh, white sandy beaches, we would not have the white sandy beaches that are iconic in the Caribbean, in South Florida. Um, those are directly made on the coral reef. So you wouldn't see that um, without the reef. Conch fritters, who here has had conch fritters before? Yes, okay. <laughs> I'm used to teaching classes uh, where nobody has ever heard of a conch before, and I have to go on a 40-minute tirade about how you're missing out on the best food on Earth. So I'm so glad that folks in here are aware of conch fritters. And if you haven't had conch fritters, just book the trip now to South Florida just for the conch fritters. And then, of course, Jimmy Buffett and the coral reefers, who I've seen live a few times, and like I said, the mayor of South Florida. Um, something that really kind of inspires me about reefs, a lot of the stuff that we talked about here, um, reefs hold, <laughs> it's 
Sorry, guys. I'm, I'm getting used to the Slido. Reefs hold a lot of cultural value to us, and this varies from location to location. So it's not going to be the same to Australians on the Great Barrier Reef as it is to folks who maybe live in the Cayman Islands. It's very particular to the culture that appreciates and depends on the reef, right? So whether we're talking about songs, art, uh, the type of activities that you do on the reef. Like, I've done a lot of work in the Cayman Islands, and one of the most touching stories that folks tell you about the reef in the Cayman Islands is it's where they teach their children how to swim. You take your kid out to swim on the reef, and that's like a rite of passage for young Caymanians. Um, so, you know, me growing up on a reef, I have different cultural touchstones for the reef compared to folks growing up in other parts of the world that happen to have reefs. Um, traditional cultural cuisines, all of these tie in with the health and vibrancy of a coral reef system. Um, like I mentioned time and time again, Jimmy Buffett, you can't go down to South Florida without seeing a coral reef mural with Jimmy Buffett's face on it. Um, he inspired a generation of people to care about reefs, myself included. And um, this cultural pull of coral reefs is what really inspired me to go into the career that I have. And um, maybe you have young folks in your family that are looking to follow a same pathway, and I would strongly encourage them to do it because there's a lot of work to be done on reefs. And um, I have some kind of tips for young folks at the end of the talk. It doesn't have to be young. It could be anyone, but just, you know, it's a really easy way to relate to children when you talk about reefs because they're so beautiful. So like I said before, uh, coral reefs are also a really big source of coastal protection. This is also important to me because I lived through Hurricane Andrew when I was a kid amongst many other quite terrible storms. Um, so one of the most efficient blockages for major hurricanes, floods, erosion, all this stuff that we kind of have to suffer through. Um, a healthy reef system does more to stop erosion, flooding, storm surge from hurricanes than anything that we could ever build. So even the most up-to-date, technologically advanced storm uh, uh, seawall, uh, riprap, all these coastal engineering solutions, they really can't compare to um, the reef. But you know, the reef, it works in conjunction with other systems like seagrass mangroves. So it's this tropical coastal seascape that if we keep it really healthy, it really does, a, does go a long way to protect us from these nasty storms. Um, at the same time, I want to kind of get into um, some of the threats to coral reefs. Coral reefs are, right now, in 2024, <coughs> some of the most threatened, but at the same time, better protected ecosystems in the United States. And I'll start with the threats, and then I'll get into the ways that we kind of look after them in the, in the US context. Um, so the threats. Uh, these are like the big three threats to coral reefs that my lab works on. The first, obviously, is climate change. It's this rapid rise in sea surface temperatures that we're dealing with. Um, people, the scientists that work here at NSF NCAR are working really hard to enable us to better understand the impacts of climate change on reefs. Um, but just know that coral reefs can only survive in a very narrow range of temperatures. So 73 to 84 degrees. And anything beyond 84, they'll basically be cooked and be more susceptible to disease and probably die off at that point. Um, we had a historically bad heat wave this past year in South Florida, unprecedented marine heat wave, um, so kind of outside of that safe range of temperatures. And what happens to a reef during a, a, heat, a heat snap, <laughs> um, like a very kind of prolonged hot period, is they have a living algae in their tissue called zooxanthellae, and they expel this algae. The algae gives them the bright color, but it also gives them a food source. So this algae that lives in their tissue, it's undergoing photosynthesis just like any other plant, and it's producing sugar, and that gives them their food source. So during these big uh, heat waves, like we just saw this past year, they're expelling the thing that helps them to feed themselves. Um, it prolongs stress, and if they repeatedly bleach like this, then they'll just be stressed, stressed, more susceptible to disease, and then ultimately maybe die. Um, we saw some really big mass mortality events in Southeast Asia when I was doing my doctoral research in 2016. We saw a really big mortality event from bleaching about two years ago on the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. So this isn't a Florida problem, this is a, a global problem. 
Okay. The second big threats to reef is nutrient runoff from our sewage system. So I had that beautiful toilet up there. This is a major cause of coral reef mortality in Florida when I was growing up because everybody runs on a, like a septic tank and people don't maintain their septic tanks. So they get um, leaks in them and then they leach out into the limestone and then that ends up in the, in the coastal waterways. So um, we've actually gone a long way in the past 20 years in Southeast Florida where I'm from to either fix these outdated septic tanks or to put the city on sewage. It's a huge improvement in the water quality. Now we're working on West Florida, uh, like the Naples area. There's a huge issue with sewage in the water out there. Um, but if you have too many nutrients in the water, um, you'll have algae grow on the outside of the coral organism, and then that blocks the light from getting to the symbiotic algae that lives in their skin. So they'll just die off because they're effectively starved because they're too shaded. And then finally, um, maybe the most striking image in my entire slide deck here, unsustainable fishing practices. This is a picture from my doctoral field work in Indonesia. People use uh, household chemicals, shake them up, it costs about a dollar, and they throw these bombs onto the coral reef. And what'll happen is these big valuable fin fish species that they can go and get quite a bit of money for in markets in like Jakarta and Singapore, they'll be stunned. So grouper, snapper, really tasty stuff. And they'll just go and collect them all off the top of the reef, just skim them all up. They'll take the, the less valuable ones and they'll sell them locally in market. Um, but there's a very big unsustainable fishing problem, especially in parts of the world that don't have really good rule of law. So like parts of the world where I worked in, like very touristy developed parts of Malaysia, Indonesia, they're doing a lot better with the unsustainable fishing practices, but if you get out into really remote areas like Sulawesi, Saba in Indonesia, it's still a very big problem. And if you've ever been diving in those parts of the world, really beautiful rugged reefs, you'll actually, um, it feels like someone's like pounding on your chest and you'll know that dynamite fishers are nearby. You can actually feel it in the water. Um, so, you know, un unsustainable fishing practices, this is not a Southeast Asia problem. This is not an East Africa problem. This is a South Florida problem too. We have lobster mini season, very famous. Everyone goes out to get lobster for a couple days. Um, and, you know, I've seen really wild stuff. Like I've been down snorkeling on a reef and I've seen a boat just drag anchor across the reef. Of course you can report them to Fish and Wildlife or the National Park Service or whatever, but you know, there's usually one law enforcement officer working for a 250 mile stretch of reef. So by the time they get out there, it's like three hours later and you've done about 300 years worth of damage to the reef. So it's happening everywhere. And you know, some type of mandatory responsible boating class could be really good in South Florida, but you know, folks don't like being told what to do, so. Um, and that's actually one of the things that we worked on as my, in my lab is like, how can you reach people that don't like being told what to do? I mean, we're probably a room of like-minded individuals that can really, you know, look at these types of damages that folks cause and say like, why can't people just, you know, not do stuff like that? But that's a big problem and a big um, kind of puzzle that we're working on in my line of research is how can we get people to voluntarily make the right choices without having that a uh, marine sanctuary law enforcement officer come out there and write them a ticket. So um, this kind of gets to what I wanted to talk about next. Remember I said that reefs are at the same time one of the most threatened but better protected ecosystems compared to any point in their history. What does that mean? Well, the United States has a pretty good policy system to look after reefs and fisheries actually. We do a really good job with this stuff. Um, I worked in fishery certification for a little bit after my doctoral degree where we would go to like the Southern Ocean and like the waters off the coast of Mexico and like um, certify fisheries as sustainably managed. The United States is gold star for this sort of stuff. We're really quite good at it. Uh, the policy frameworks, the laws, the regulatory folks that work on this stuff, um, it's kind of a model. You know, we uh, other countries that I've worked in um, have looked at the US system for guidance on this sort of thing. So we are doing some good things. Um, now, that said, the system that we have is very complicated. Um, and even this, so this is the reef that I grew up on. Um, you have the reefs up here, they're managed by a group of NGOs and uh, kind of like state level fishing laws. Um, but here, this is the National Park Service that's running this stretch of reef. 
Here it's a state park, here it's a federal sanctuary, and here it's the National Park Service again. So even as you go the whole length of the reef, you have different people in charge of different stretches of the reef, even though it's kind of like one connected ecosystem, right? So that gets to the problem with you know, law enforcement. Like what if you're out here and the only person available is like a state or a county sheriff? Like it's just a very kind of complex system of managing this reef. Um, now, something that I want to talk about, and this is the most complicated academic nerd slide of the whole deck. Um, so if you get through this one, you did it. Uh, so I mentioned the threats to reef, and I mentioned um, how our management system that we have in place right now, it's pretty good. You know, go over to, you know, I don't want to um, have anyone catch strays, but, you know, go over to Indonesia and then come back here. And, you know, I'm very grateful for what we have here in terms of our governance. Um, but given how important reefs are and the big three threats, um, I really want to figure out how we can better adapt to and manage for these threats and do it in a way where we're not reacting 10 years after the fact. Maybe we can more so anticipate them before they come. Um, so this is an emerging form of coral reef management, and it makes sure that every group of people that care about the reef, whether you're a tourist, a commercial lobsterman, a tour guide, a local community that really cares about the coastal protection for your home. You're all in dialogue. You're talking about the reef. You're talking about the sacrifices that you may have to make. Um, you know, a lot of these conversations that I've been a part of with the reef, you know, there's a group of people that are asking to sacrifice something, right? So right now, um, I'm helping some folks with the rewrite to the management plan for the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. And the, even the management to the federal sanctuary, which is one group managing it, there's confusing rules all over the reef. You're allowed to do catch and release fishing in this extent, but you're not allowed to do it here. Um, and what they want to do is they want to simplify this. And they want to kind of crack down on fishing and uh, trawling in areas of the reef that are particularly vulnerable or have a unique ecosystem. Um, so all of that is to say, um, if people are talking, it's a lot easier to, over time, say, hey, we're asking you to make a little sacrifice here. We're asking you to kind of stop uh, maybe your recreational fishing business operating in this particular area, but look at all these other areas that you can go and fish in. So if you're talking to each other over time, it's a little easier to ask people to make these kinds of sacrifices versus if you just kind of announce it after the fact and you're like, you're done fishing in this area. That never works. Um, so... Um, we want to also make sure that everybody who has a seat at the decision-making table is included. A big issue in South Florida um, is we have a massive Spanish-speaking population. A lot of these meetings and a lot of these um, sort of collaborative efforts don't have a Spanish language component to them. So in some of these towns, you're leaving out about half of the people who live there. And again, you know, you may have views on that. You may think, well, you know, it's the government. We speak in English. Um, but if you're leaving out half of your neighbors and you're asking them to make a sacrifice to protect the reef, you want to make sure everybody can kind of understand and be on the same page. So you want to include everybody. And then the last thing, the thing that I'm really going to talk about today is we want to make sure that we are able to include the best available science and technology when it comes to responding to things like this massive heat wave that we just had. And I'll talk about some of these experimental ways that we're starting to respond to these big crises. And I'll just kind of give a little spoiler here. I'm pretty optimistic. There's some really neat stuff going on. And the only obstacle is ourselves, right? Like a lot of these really unique responses that we can have to some of these big threats like climate change, you know, it's just a matter of scaling them up, moving faster, turning these technologies cheaper. And I'll talk a little bit about this as I go on. So uh, some of the research that we do here, we're prototyping methods to study this uh, relationship, adaptive governance, how we can improve it, how we can make adaptive governance easier to follow, and um, maybe just kind of like the, the modus operandi in the future, like how we actually look after reefs. So we're prototyping these methods to study adaptive governance. What works? What doesn't work? Do we have what it takes to stop the big three threats to coral reefs? And like I said, make sure our children and grandchildren have reefs. So to do this, we're working with the Climate and Global Dynamics Lab here at NCAR, the CGD lab. And we're using their climate models, which to date have helped 
um, you know, at the global scale. Like we know what's going on at the global scale. But if we go to say the mayor of Key Largo, we, we don't want to say, hey, you know, we're going to see a shift in two degrees globally. We want to say, what is this changing climate going to look like in 10 years specifically for Key Largo and your coral reefs? And that's different from Key West and their coral reefs. So we're looking at these very localized scales, giving people very practical knowledge that they can then kind of incorporate into their jobs. And, and we, you know, we've met with folks anywhere from the county commissioners to sitting senators, congressmen, state legislators, NGOs, everybody that you can think of, we've come to them with these NCAR models. And what, what are we kind of bringing over to these decision makers? Well, it's outputs from this amazing NCAR climate projection model called the community. Er oh, thank God it's not me. <laughs> it's OK. <laughs> um, so we take the outputs from this climate model. It's called the Community Earth System Model version 2, large ensemble, CESM2LE. Um, I just call it the model, the NCAR scientists model. And it predicts how much of the reef system is going to bleach. Um, you know, we talked about that bleaching, that mortality. Um, and we're looking at how much of the reef is going to bleach and possibly die in 10 years, and how much is going to bleach and possibly die in about 20 years. And these really localized forecasts that even vary down to the keys, so Marathon, Isla Mirada, Key West, um, we're able to go to these local decision makers with these outputs and say, here's what you're going to see. And it's the best available science that we have. Um, so what we do with them is we sit down, we buy them a coffee, and we say, what are your options? Here's what we see is going to happen. What are your options to respond to this? Where do you need more information? Where do you need more capacity or financing to help you respond to this sort of thing? And um, that's how we get these insights on adaptive governance and possible um, really experimental, innovative things that we can do to respond. So um, this is a type of research called participatory research. And it's when you kind of make it hand in hand with um, all the people who work in government, from the federal park managers down to the state level, county, municipal, NGOs. You know, we even met with faith-based leaders in some towns who have a lot of funding to kind of implement some of these um, restoration efforts. So everybody that you can think of that has a hand in public life or civic life, we're giving them these future outputs from the NCAR model, and we're really kind of working with them to see, hey, you know, are you going to be able to adapt to this sort of thing? Do you need help? Where could that help come from? And this is a new type of research, and it really kind of blends the, um, you know, the NCAR model, the CESM2LE, with some ecological modeling. And then we get to our interviews with decision makers and stakeholders. And then we can kind of revise the way that we think about adaptive governance. Um, one, of the, one of the things that we really want to do in this type of research is engage the public. So we do a lot of public meetings, radio shows, podcasts. We don't want to be scientists that kind of put everything in journals and nobody can read them because they're $35 paywalled articles. We want everything out there. We want it in plain language. It could be jargony. It could be a snooze fest sometimes. But we really do our best to try to not make it like that and try to make it into something that is quite useful to the people that could actually take that knowledge and apply it to decision making. Um, and engaging decision makers about climate change can be tough sometimes, right? Like it's, you know, often, you know, every issue, especially now, can be hyper-partisan and politicized. But we really try to bring it down to what have you seen in your day-to-day -day life? Does that match what we're projecting with our NCAR models? And oftentimes the answer is yes. And in many cases, when we would bring, hey, here's what we're seeing for a 20-year projection. Here's what we're seeing for a 10-year projection. They would say, your estimates are too conservative. We started to see this 10 years ago. And this is people all over the political spectrum. So um, you know, sometimes engaging decision makers can be a little you know, um, spicy, but sometimes it can be really quite rewarding. And in this particular research, it definitely was. Um, something that we do, because we talk to all different sorts of people, like we talk to some people who don't have a high school degree. They've been working as uh, fishermen for 40 years. And we don't want to come to them and talk about the CSM2LE model or physical oceanography. We don't want to talk about that stuff with them. We want to talk about simple, 
changes on the system that you can talk about in plain language. And we do this um, by using these very short, uh, simple, easy to understand stories that are based on the output of the NCAR model. And we use these images to kind of help guide the conversation. So when we sit down with people, we hand them this image, we read them this little story, or we call it a scenario, and we say, have you seen something like this going on on the reef? And oftentimes, you know, like I said, the answer is, not only have I seen it, but it started way longer than what you are saying. It's been going on since I was your age, you know? So oftentimes these photos, you know, especially with people who don't have a scientific background, they don't have a modeling background, you're bringing the outputs of a very complicated simulation model of so many different systems in the world, boiling it down to this little story right here in this little picture, and people are like, oh, I know exactly what you're talking about. And it's grounded in some of the best science um, and some of the best modeling projections that exist in terms of our global climate. Um, here's another example of a story that we show people whenever we sit down to do our research. If you look at these two things, so this is the 20 year projection, you can see noticeably fewer fish, fewer boats, fewer users. Um, you see different compositions to the reef itself, like you have these whipped corals, these plume corals, um, versus these older, um, or these 10 year out projections where you have much more hard coral, um, these Acropora coral, you have bigger fishing schools, or fish schools, you have a, a fleet of boats that just has much more diverse users than what you see in the 20 year predict prediction. Um, now, once we're done with these conversations, we've shown them the pictures, we've had these discussions, um, what do we do with all this information? And you know, this information, it spans physical, biological, social science. What do we do with this all? Well, um, we have kind of like our, our model of what the system is go, what the changes that this system is going to undergo. And we can take this to people like the governor's office or the National Office of Marine Sanctuaries and say, here's what people are dealing with right now. Here's what they're gonna be dealing with in 10 years. Here's what they're gonna be dealing with in 20 years. So what are the type of policy responses or on the ground management responses that we can do to respond to these changes? So first and very importantly, um, all the commercial recreational species that we love and associate with Florida, lobsters, uh, snapper, yellow-tailed snapper, all of those fish are moving north. So, um, you know, the name of the talk, and I'll come back to this slide again, the name of this talk, when the lobsters march north, I was interviewing one of the elder commercial lobster fishermen who told me that he's been fishing for spiny lobster longer than I've been alive. And he told me, by the time you're my age, so 70s, 80s, the lobster will actually be harvested off the coast of North Carolina. So right now they harvest them down in the Florida Keys. Obviously he was being, you know, a little bit hyperbolic to make a point, but he was like, they're really moving northward so quickly that by the time, you know, you're in your 80s, they'll probably be up off the coasts of North Carolina. So um, this is a, a documented phenomenon. It is increasing, it's called tropicalization, and it's not just spiny lobster that we're seeing moving northward. It's also species like red mangrove, for example. So um, coming back to this overall model of the system, the other thing, uh, during the peak tourist season, June, when I was a kid, this was big uh, snorkeling diving season. It was wonderful. You would get out of school, you would go snorkel or dive the reef. What we heard from about 40 interviews with these stakeholders that work on the reef was that nowadays the windiness, the storminess, the earlier tropical storms in the season have made it so that the water is actually too cloudy and too rough to really dependably take people out on these reef tours the way they used to. So a lot of folks that used to run uh, snorkeling diving tours in June have shifted to becoming Uber drivers in June. So they're becoming part-time waiters, part-time drivers, gig, gig economy people, instead of um, you know, really accessing the reef during the peak time, the month of June. And this just happened. Like we saw barrel come through. It was the earliest category five ever recorded. So you know, Florida people look at that and we're like, <laughs> not surprising. You know, it, it sneaks up on you over the course of your life whenever you really pay attention to the tropics, right? Um, and then this last thing here, um, and the stuff that I'm gonna kind of end on, um, remember whenever I was talking about adaptive governance, we we're talking about these experimental policy responses, these things that you could do on the reef to really um, kind of like anticipate the change and respond to it. 
the big experimental thing that's going to kind of like moonshot, uh, protect the reef, maybe even save the reef, are these coral restorations. And they're really, really cool. Um, they are growing coral, um, either in nurseries onshore or offshore. And I have some more pictures a little later on. And they're selecting based on genotype of these corals for ones that are disease tolerant and heat tolerant. So we just, in addition to the marine heat wave, we had one of the worst disease outbreaks in history, stony coral tissue loss. We don't really know the pathogen for stony coral tissue loss, but it just absolutely decimated our reefs. What we were able to do really quickly though, um, not me, but like others who work in conservation, and there are thousands who work on this reef, um, they were able to kind of isolate the genotypes of certain types of coral that were better resistant to stony coral tissue loss and more heat tolerant. So they're actively growing these types of corals in these nurseries onshore and offshore, and they're replanting the coral on the reef. So these are these experimental policy responses. So you see uh, target species shifting northwards. You see people transitioning their livelihoods, and you see people urgently responding as quickly as possible with the latest technology. OK, I already showed you all this. Um, real quick, did you guys know that the Maine and the Florida lobster are different lobsters? Yes. OK, by show of hands, who prefers Maine lobster? Oh. And who prefers Florida lobster, spiny lobster? Yes. Good. OK, we, the Maine lobster definitely won. You guys should, you guys should lie for the sake of the speaker. <laughs> OK, um, I think I have a trivia question here. OK. Yes, so you've told us a little bit about how people are adapting and the threats for the reefs. So we were wondering, uh, wanted to hear from the audience of how they thought people could protect reefs. So Kelly, if you wanna, I can scroll through these a bit if there's any you want to respond to. Yeah, um, well, go, go back up to the top if you don't mind. Um, so definitely education, this is a big one. Um, just educating folks about what's going on. Um, that's so important. And then just taking, you know, day-to-day -day steps to ensure that we're not kind of making the, the problem worse, right? Um, I think the most important thing is policy. I think the most, you know, um, la large scalable change uh, in terms of things like decarbonizing the grid, right, our electrical grid, that's not my area, so I'm not going to delve into that. But I, I will say those big changes are going to come from policy, definitely. Um, dumping into the ocean street drains, that's so important. It's so important. And people don't realize that. They don't make the connection. So um, cutting back on burning fossil fuels for sure. Um, Public-private efforts, definitely. Um, even a lot of these restoration efforts, like I talked about in, in that previous slide, that's a big public-private partnership there. Um, you have some really kind of uh, successful folks who have done really well in their lives who are just like dumping their fortunes into like accelerating this as quickly as possible and w uh, working really closely with the federal government on something called Mission Iconic Reefs to up to scale up this restoration, reduce emissions, funding research. I like that one because it <laughs> brings students to the lab. <laughs> uh, climate change mitigation policies, definitely. So these de decarbonization things, um, I obviously have you know, a passion and shifting over to nuclear power, but that's a very political opinion. I won't get into it, but that's like my, you know, <laughs> please, I hope we do it. <laughs> but uh, reef safe sunscreen, definitely. I mean, the there are a lot of boats that, that we go on for our research in South Florida, and they don't allow you on the boat with the non-reef safe sunscreen. So that's a big um, tool that we have in our toolbox. Uh, mitigate climate change impacts, become more aware. Uh, they take thousands of years to grow and, and days to die. That's so well said. Uh, keep a distance. Oh, I wish that whoever wrote that could be out on the reef with me. Um, this is a big problem on reefs. Like even really conservation-minded people who love the reef. I mean, if you only go diving once a year, your neutral buoyancy might be a little not so good, right? So, you know, always keep a distance, even when there's like a really cool eel or something that you really want to see, <laughs> just, you know, the distance. Pollution, definitely. Um, I worked on a project uh, when I was living in Texas called Nurdle Patrol. And it's those little plastic nurdles that go in to make like glasses and every plastic little thing. And these microplastics that like fall off freight trains, like the nurdles and stuff like that, they're everywhere. So maybe like reducing plastics. Wake up, yes, <laughs> well said. <laughs> 
uh, vote for people committed to protecting the environment. You know, that's a spicy one in South Florida because some folks who have sent quite a bit of funding to our reefs, like Senator Marco Rubio saved our Aquarius reef face. It, the interesting, one of the things that we study in my lab is how some ecosystems are so charismatic that they transcend the partisan divide. <laughs> and what, what we have written papers on is how can we take the magic of reefs that cause Democratic and Republican senators to really invest, put their money where their mouth is, how can we take that magic and kind of spread it around to other things? So that's an interest of ours. Uh, don't touch, definitely vote, please go vote. Um, advocate for climate legislation, uh, I feel helpless. Don't feel helpless. Um, I'll show you some slides to eradicate your helplessness. <laughs> um, okay, cool. So uh, remember earlier on, we talked about this idea of adaptive governance. This is really catching on. The federal government is like all in on this more like anticipatory um, ocean management, ocean policy. Uh, we just wrote a paper in this. It's open access, so anybody can look at it, looking at how different presidential administrations have managed coastal systems, beginning with the Obama administration and their regional oceans planning. Like, we've come a very long way in the past 10 years with the way that we think about and manage for oceans. That shifts a little bit, presidential administration to, to administration, but it's definitely something that's changed for the better in the past 10, 15 years. Um, all right, the thing that I wanted to really focus on here, um, because it's so important to saving Florida reefs and responding to those big three threats, is this ability to experiment with public policy. And I kind of gave this away already, but look how cool this is. You cannot look at this and feel hopeless. It's awesome. And the people who are working on this are some of the smartest, most dedicated uh, Moat Marine Lab, uh, the University of Miami, some of these nurseries are just absolutely incredible. And like that person who wrote that comment, a lot of these are public-private partnerships. Um, you have some emirates, some Arab emirates that are just pouring money into these things. You have very wealthy, uh, notable individuals. Um, people have really come together with this thing. And in some of my interviews, actually, they said, funding is not a problem. We have so much money, we don't know what to do with it. What we need is more land space to uh, contain these types of nurseries, right? So it's like the, the smallness of the Florida Keys is the big limiter because they're just kind of like really well-funded at this point with these sorts of things. But the people that are working on this stuff, they're really motivated by scaling up, right? So we said in the beginning of the reef, or the beginning of the talk, 25% of marine organisms live on reefs. You can't just replant 12 of these things and replicate a reef, right? Plus, like the commenter said, it takes thousands of years to grow this beautiful coral, right? So we have to do this very fast. So in some of our interviews, people are working on really high technology things, like um, some of these Christmas tree style nurseries where the plastic that they're being kind of grown on right now, where that kind of dissolves away over time and it'll just naturally fall onto the reef. And then this is kind of replicated millions of times over, so scaling up very quickly. And the federal government right now has invested more money than ever in our history for these types of really innovative, they're calling them moonshot style solutions. It's called the Mission Iconic Reefs Program. And what I like about Mission Iconic Reefs, I think it's a brilliant program because they um, trust uh, local community groups to really manage a lot of this. So there's this Little nonprofit in the Keys, it's much bigger now than when I was a kid, but it's called Reef, the Reef Education Foundation, something like that. So they'll, you know, they won't take this money and kind of keep it in the federal government far away in DC. They'll kind of like outsource these ideas and these projects to these local groups. So what's next? Um, well, I do want to say before I move on from this, there are some obstacles to this. A lot of these are self-made. Um, when I was interviewing somebody who was really at the cutting edge of this stuff, they said they have to get 29 different permits in order to build their nurseries. You know, I, I get it, right? You don't want people out there doing like the Disneyland on the reef, right? You don't want people doing silly stuff and people do silly stuff, right? But at the same time, if you need to get 29 state and federal permits and some of those permits are duplicated and some of them are chicken and egg where, you know, oh, you need the state first, but the feds say that you need the, you know, there's pointing you in different directions. The, the pace 
the scale, the intensity that we need to be doing this with, it's not possible right now. So quickly finding ways to cut through that red tape while making sure that you don't have you know, folks out there doing silly stuff, right? And I've been out there during lobster mini season, folks get up to some silly stuff on the reef, right? So you want to kind of balance that policy, that regulation with the urge to like move very quickly and be able to experiment. Um, okay, what's next? Um, we're developing some new research. We're going to apply all of what we've found here with our research method, incorporating the physical model outputs from CSM2LE uh, to the bio model, to the interviews with the pictures. We're going to bring this over to the Mountain West and we're going to apply it to the most climate sensitive species in the mountains, so trout. We're going to look at native trout and we're going to look at um, trout that are kind of like grown. Uh, in aquaculture facilities and stocked. So we're gonna do these same methods, these same techniques, um, modeling the snowpack, precipitation, all the way down to individual anglers and then back up to like the fisheries biologists in the National Forest Service, National Park Service, state fisheries managers. So we're gonna kind of replicate this study over the next three years on freshwater systems out here. Um, this is kind of like a little reminder of what we've done and where we're heading. Um, so, you know, but in the trout context, it's going to just look a little bit different, but these same NCAR inputs, um, we just, it's a little bit too early to announce, but we just got a really nice grant come through and we're really grateful for it from the National Science Foundation. So we're going to be recruiting somebody for a PhD to kind of run this research with us. So if you know someone who's looking for a really neat PhD, kind of at the forefront of how we think about and study climate and they love fishing like I do, send them to me. <laughs> Okay, um, here's some references for you. And I just wanna thank you for your time. I know these can get a little academic at times, but um, you know, one thing that I do wanna say is you are part of the solution coming out to NCAR, coming to talks like this, spreading this type of knowledge around, getting people motivated to be part of the solution. Every little bit helps. And I hope the person that put hopeless maybe feels a little less hopeless. <laughs> Um, okay, here's all my contact. If you want to get in touch with me, please uh, write to me anytime. I'll write you back. Thank you. <laughs> all right, so we will be getting to questions, all your um, burning questions for Kelly. Um, and so we want to give you a little time to think about them and put them in the Slido. And while we do that, we're going to go to um, one of the Slido questions about with the picture asking, what location do you think this picture was taken? What do you think, Kelly? How'd they do? Perfect. Perfect. I'm going to plant you all in my classes so I get some more accurate responses when I'm working with undergrads. <laughs> Um, so the, the, the picture could have been either in Indonesia or, oh, well, Indonesia, Australia, or Hawaii. So the way that you know this, you're looking at an Indo-Pacific reef. If you're looking at an Indo-Pacific reef, so a coral reef that occurs in the Pacific Ocean, a, a dead giveaway for that is a clownfish. We don't have clownfish. Show the picture again while you're talking about it. Sorry. Sorry, apologies. Uh, those little orange and white striped fish in the anemone, you'll only see those on Indo-Pacific reefs. So finding Nemo, it could never take place in the waters of South Florida because we don't have the clownfish in South Florida. So anytime you're looking at a clownfish, it could be Indonesia, Australia. Yeah, it could be Indonesia, Australia, Hawaii. When I was growing up, I was always so jealous of Indo-Pacific because I really wanted to see these clownfish. It was like one of the big grievances of my childhood. No clownfish. <laughs> but again, you guys did such a great job with your answers. Really strong showing here. Does anyone in the room have a question we can start with? Yes. And we're going to ask you guys to use the microphone so that the folks tuning in on Zoom can hear, if that's OK. So I also understand that the lionfish is a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you for asking about that. That's a huge Florida problem. And we've tried to do uh, culls, organized culls for lionfish. Um, some really well-known 
conservationists in South Florida have put these together over the past 20 years. Uh, they're called lionfish derbies or lionfish rodeos, and people go out. Um, I myself have gone out and speared lionfish before. Um, I've had lionfish sting me before when I'm trying to hand a stringer of lionfish. It's very tasty uh, meat, very small fillets though. And if you go to the grocery store in Florida, Publix, $29 a pound. I mean, that was like five years ago prices, so probably like $50 a pound now. But you know, there's a, there's a lot of labor to get to these little fillets, but they're delicious, they're so good. Um, but you know, th these are super important community events, like the, the Lionfish Rodeo, the Lionfish Derby in uh, you know, Marathon Key, Alamorada, Key West, they're really popular and people come from all over the world to participate in them. And this, it's called hand culling, like you remove by hand. The unfortunate thing is every time a lionfish spawns, they can release up to like 20,000 juvenile lionfish or something like that. So it's like the scale of the problem is worsening and worsening and they're also adapting. So they're more able to survive in estuarine environments in this brackish water and they're able to go up to colder latitudes like up in North Carolina, they've seen them, they've seen them all over Texas. It's a huge problem on the Southwest Florida coast where you have the 10,000 islands and that murkier water where you don't have so many people that are able to get out and go diving out there because there's no reefs on the west side of Florida. Um, but it is a huge problem and they reduce biomass on the reef. They eat like 90% of the fish on the reef. So they're a huge problem. Um, you know, the solution to that, again, it's a human problem, right? Like people get these exotic fish that don't belong in the Caribbean, Florida reefs. They belong in the Indo-Pacific reefs. And they say, these lionfish are eating everything in my reef tank, so I'm just going to throw it out into the sea. Can't do that. It's a huge problem in South Florida, exotic pets. You know, when I was a kid, you would never see iguana. Now I go home to South Florida to visit family. Iguana are everywhere, everywhere. You can't drive down the street without running over an iguana highly invasive species. You can hunt them with like a little 22 caliber rifle. They're just everywhere, everywhere. I've had them before grilled. I've had lionfish, you know, but the, the, you know, you can't solve these problems with these fun community events. They're great. They build awareness, they build education, but you have to stop it at the solution. Like we really shouldn't be having these exotic animals in these places where they just get out and just, you know, explode. <laughs> All right, we have a question online from Kelly Murphy. Question is, in Indonesia, is anything being done to mitigate the enormous flow of plastics into rivers leading to the ocean that will mitigate reef impact? Yeah, uh, Indonesia has a huge problem with plastics, marine plastics, um, but so does Texas, right? Like it, and you know, I've done a lot of uh, plastics collection in Indonesia, in Texas, all over. Um, it's interesting, like the dynamics of, of where you find plastics from. Most of our plastics that we would pull up in our surveys in Texas were from Haiti. They were vinegar bottles from Haiti. Yeah, so like you have this current in the Gulf and it would just like bring it up from Haiti and like around the Gulf. Um, but again, you know, a lot of the plastic pollution in Southeast Asia, some of our recycling programs in this country um, you know, people think that it's melted down and it's turned into like, you know, the next thing. But in many cases, it's crushed and sent overseas for people in other countries to deal with and dispose of. So, um, you know, and that's not to say you shouldn't recycle. You should recycle, but we shouldn't do it in this way where we just send our trash to low income countries and ask them to do something with it. Right. So what happens when those barges of our plastic trash from Western wealthier countries get to Indonesia? is they throw it in the sea because <laughs> there's nowhere to put it, right? It's an archipelago. Um, actually, it's as big as the US, but it's like thousands of islands, right? So um, there's not much land area w where you can bury it in a landfill or um, even like the incineration uh, technology that we have in our dumps, like they don't necessarily have that over there. So it's a huge problem. I have photos from my doctoral research in Indonesia where the tide goes out and it's like a rainbow. Everyone's seen these online. It's like a rainbow of plastics. Um, and where I did my research, actually, uh, some of the islands are Hindu and some are Muslim. I did most of my research on Hindu islands and they um, say a prayer in the morning and they pray to the water. So some of the interviews that I took would, would talk about how like, you know, it's really sad that we pray to the water as a deity in our faith 
but when the tide goes out, it's just like completely full of trash, right? So it's like a spiritual problem to people over there. Um, what would help that? Um, honestly, it's like a, a policy thing, right? Like we need to do something very big when it comes to plastics. Obviously you need plastics for like modern medicine and food sanitation and stuff like that. But you know, do we need, in the United States, do we need plastic water bottles? Do we need the plastic water bottles that are this big? You know, so, and I don't have the right solution to this. Like, you know, they just kind of banned single use plastics in Breckenridge and we'll see how it goes. But, you know, that's a small town, pretty well off folks. Uh, they buy into it. Now imagine trying to do something like that in Houston. Like it's, it's just not the same. So, you know, you wanna strike the right mix of telling people what to do versus asking them and getting people to wanna do it on their own. Is there a question in the audience? In terms of um, lobsters marching north, which is a wonderful image, about how f m how far, how many miles further north are spiny lobsters found now, where compared to like um, 50 years ago? Yeah, it's a great question. And the commercial lobstermen that we interviewed for our research project talked specifically about where they take their fleet now. So it used to be that they would launch their fleet off of the Middle Keys, so Isla Morada Marathon. And they would mostly catch from their traps in the Middle Keys and then just up the stretch of the Keys. What the commercial, commercial lobstermen told me is nowadays they catch most of what they catch up off the coast of Palm Beach County. And that's where I'm from. I grew up in Palm Beach County. I did not grow up in Palm Beach, but I grew up in Palm Beach County. So it's three. So from Miami to, say, Delray Beach, where I'm from, um, three hours driving. I'm not sure, quite sure the distance, but I know the time driving on 95 is about three hours. <laughs> um, but, you know, that's a, that's a distance, right? And we're talking about, like, increased fuel expenditures for the fleets of boats. We're talking about increased labor costs for people that have to be on these boats for longer. So as, you know, even down in the Middle Keys, if you're starting from Isla Morada and you're driving up to where I'm from, that's a four hour drive, right, by car. So if you're going by some of these smaller boats that they use to harvest lobster, you're adding a sizable amount of time and, and fixed costs to your voyage. And it's only gonna get worse as they go up and up and up. All right, we have another online question. Is it possible for dead coral reefs to recover and be restored from Denali Pinto? Yeah, um, really good question. So uh, it depends on the amount of annual bleaching. So when I was a kid, a bleaching event would happen once every 20 years. Now they happen every year. So the frequency of these bleaching events has increased. When you have the bleaching occur every year, uh, the immune system of the coral organism is weak, they're more susceptible to disease, and they experience mortality events, big death events. Um, we shared a, a link uh, about one of the most recent mortality events on the Great Barrier Reef, um, huge bleaching event. You can have a big stretch of reef bleach and not die, like it could bleach. And when you look at a bleached coral reef, um, if you've ever burned yourself and like the, the skin kind of swells up around your burn, the actual coral organism looks swollen. It looks like it's painful for the organism. So imagine yourself getting burned frequently, right? Eventually you're gonna have more serious health problems that result from that, infections, um, you know, wider system problems in your body. It's the same with the reef, it's the same with the coral organism. So when you're seeing these regular annual bleaching events, you do see the mortality spread more and more. So when I was doing my doctoral research, um, you know, we were counting like squares about one meter by one meter, and we would estimate the percentage of living coral in those one meter squares to kind of give a rule of thumb measure of how healthy the reef was. We had a confounding event, something that threw our measurements off. You know, we were looking at like dynamite fishing, destructive fishing, um, but we were in the middle of a big bleaching event. So technically it was alive, but it was bleached. So we had an issue where we were like, well, should we count this as alive or dead? So we had to go back for a couple more years and we did find evidence of pretty severe 
mortality in the 2016 bleaching event in Indonesia? So it was a very long meandering question. Yes, they can come back after a bleaching event, but it becomes harder and harder for them to do so with each subsequent bleaching. Uh, and to clarify, if you go on Slido, there's the link that Kelly was talking about. Um, is there any questions? Thank you for your great presentation, Thank you. Kelly. Um, you said policy is the number one issue, and, and policy is made by politicians. And there's a certain darling element to the coral reefs and Nemo and et cetera, et cetera. Yet, you mentioned two of the major causes of the destruction of, of uh, the reefs were climate change and sewage falling in. And mm. the climate change, you're facing climate change deniers. Mm -hmm. And the sewage, you're facing people that say regulations are bad. Yeah. So I'm just wondering how you are able to sort of bring in the darling nature of the coral reefs and maybe educate or shift some people who are climate change deniers or you know, saying we don't need more regulations. Yeah, that's such a good question. Um, now, I'll give you uh, Weasley answers for some of them because you know, my expertise is not on rapid decarbonization of our electrical grid, which is absolutely essential for combating climate and for bringing the temperature down very quickly. But you know, other aspects of that, why do people have private jets? You know, So it's like um, rapid deployment of small scale nuclear reactors, similar to how the US Navy runs submarines. Awesome, like we could do that today. We have the technology already. It's political will, you know. Again, I'm getting way into the realm of Kelly's opinion versus like what we ought to do. And um, here's your Weasley answer. Vote for the people that do the things that you think ought to be done, right? Um, I'm a big time nuclear supporter. That's my opinion. I'm not telling you as a scientist, like we have to go and do nuclear. There are issues with nuclear, there are drawbacks, but there are drawbacks to everything. There's drawbacks to burning coal for our power, right? So, you know, and then talking about sewage, you know, there's some point, um, the, the thing that really interests me is where you meet the perfect tension and threshold between telling people what to do and asking people to do things voluntarily. Sewage is a perfect example of that threshold. Um, the government incentivized a lot of people in Southeast Florida with uh, tax breaks or just grants to replace that shoddy old septic system with um, coming onto the sewage line. But they also said, if you don't take us up on this free money that we're helping you with in 10 years, you have to have it or you're gonna get you know, some type of financial penalty, right? So there's like a, a, a sweet spot when it comes to like telling folks what to do. You know, in, I'll, I'll use the Indonesian example, for example. Poaching is illegal, but if you go out to these marine protected areas, they're poaching every day and they're very generous. They'll share a garbage bag worth of poached fish with you if you're just you know, a foreigner visiting their land. They're super friendly folks. So we can tell people what to do until we're blue in the face, but if people don't listen, um, you know, then you have a compliance and an enforcement problem like we talked about with like folks dragging their anchor along the reef. So I'm really interested in these kind of like sweet spots where you're, you have enough of an educated public where they make the right choice, right? So I've done some work on like, how do we ask anglers in states like Alabama, Mississippi, Texas to use tackle that's sea turtle friendly? What types of educational programs work on them? Where are they getting their education from? Are they getting it from Facebook? Are they getting it from bulletin boards? Are they getting it from uh, little door hangers that the county puts on their doors? Because if we say, oh, we're gonna have the cops out there checking your tackle to make sure you're using turtle-friendly tackle. We have like two police officers in the entire county. Like it's a multi-hundred mile stretch of coast, right? So um, I'm really interested just as, a, as your everyday nerd in where this sweet spot is between telling folks what to do because you know ultimately folks just don't listen sometimes, right? And then like making people want these things on their own. Um, but yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that there's a huge problem right now with you know, folks who are more interested in what their coalitions want than in actually solving problems. So on one side, you know, renewable energy coalition. Um, will renewable en energy solve everything when it's uh, cold and dark outside? I don't know. And then on the other side, you know, just completely unregulated burn our uh, oil and gas because we're so wealthy and we have it, thank goodness. Okay, well that can't work forever, right? So we have to have 
you know, I, I believe, again, Kelly's opinion, that we need to have more kind of like solutions-oriented policymakers than people that are kind of beholden to their coalition on both sides. What do you think about that? I like to hear, you know, I, when people ask me questions like this, I like to hear their answer too. So we have kind of continuation on, on your, your point there. Um, another question oh, no. line. I don't like these opinion questions. <laughs> I hope that um, you all know that I, I'm definitely of the Socratic mindset where um, though, don't trust people who say that they have the answers for you. Because oftentimes, you know, um, scrutinize, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. So anything that I say, scrutinize it, please. I don't have the answers. Does your work include any social science? Oh, do you want to read it, Elizabeth? You can, you okay, got it. okay. Do, does your work include any social science or psychology elements like conservation behavior change theory or climate change anxiety grief? No, Nicole, but if you're interested in this, you could really bring a lot to my lab, especially when we're recruiting for this PhD, because, you know, a big thing that we're anticipating finding with this uh, trout project is native occurring trout just being pushed out of their uh, mountain lakes and their habitats. So what happens to a little Colorado town when they lose their um, Colorado River cutthroat, right? That's tragic, right? But I don't have this background in psychology and behavior, but if I found you know, this expertise to collaborate with or to bring in someone with this interest, there's a huge role for it in the work that I do. I would love that. I just don't know enough about it. <laughs> Now, I can take a guess, right? And so can you, right? Like if, you know, I remember really beautiful, bright yellow elkhorn coral everywhere on the reefs in South Florida when I was a kid. Those are gone. And part of me thinks, did I make that up? No, I did not. Because I have like little uh, horrible photos of whatever technology existed from back in the 90s. But, um, you know, I've experienced what you're talking about myself, and it's definitely occurring. Um, I would say it's not like a, a new new thing, like I'm sure that there's a, a specialist on this sort of thing that works right here at CU Boulder. Um, but it is something that's like a lot of fertile ground to do really cool research on. So if this is your interest, Nicole, follow it because folks like me would love to work with you. Any other in-house questions? Cool, okay, good. Well, um, if you wanna get in touch, please. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so this might be a little specific, but I also work with CESM outputs. And what I'm trying to do is show those outputs to farmers. Wow. And so I thought that your drawing idea was really innovative and cool. Um, but I think that a difference between like farms and reefs is that farms are self-managed lands and reefs are more of a commons. Yeah. So I was wondering if you had any advice for sharing uh, CESM outputs for farmers. Yeah, um, so, you know, we're talking about like, you know, the outputs here, and then we kind of turn these into these photos that we would show people. Um, the other difference between reefs and farms is people can lay their eyes on a farm, right? Sometimes you would be meeting with a county commissioner in Key West and they'd be like, oh, I can't even swim. You know, I never go out there. <laughs> but they have decision-making responsibilities over the coastal seascape and the adjacent community. So um, I think it kind of depends on what you're trying to show people. Like, I'm just assuming what you're trying to show people is like topsoil erosion and like, I don't know, nutrient issues. And those are really complicated issues. Um, so I think there is a place for this type of research, um, especially when it comes to like any type of, 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 you know, you see people's eyes glaze over when you're giving a lecture or when you're interviewing them, right? Like some people are just like, what is she talking about? A climate model, like I, you know, so I think where they help is when you see people get really confused about what you're talking about, or you see them get really bored and not engaged. If you have just like a visual image or a video or 
just some type of thing that kind of switches up the conversation a little bit, I think it really kind of increases the buy-in of whoever you're talking to, and it just makes the conversation much more lively and interesting, even if the picture isn't like dead on what you were going for. But I bet, you know, if you want to uh, get in touch, I bet that we could maybe brainstorm some ideas for what it could look like. Happy to do it. I should say, these are not my drawings. Um, these drawings are done by Kristen Crumhart right there. So if you work in this building, Kristen does these drawings, and she loves this sort of thing. Um, we were replicating some of this research in Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary, kind of off the coast of Galveston. And these reefs look a lot different from the reefs in South Florida. They're more like massive uh, mounds almost, underwater mounds. And they have these big, um, you know, whereas in South Florida you have these branching corals. In Texas they have more of these mound corals. And you can tell. You can just look at Kristen's drawings and it's like, those are Texas reefs. Those are Florida <laughs> reefs. So talented. Um, I think even just like stimulating people with a picture, right? Everybody here has been to an art museum. You know, you kind of get the wheels turning when there's a picture in front of you. I think it just livens the conversation, even if it's not like perfect, perfectly representing. Because, you know, our pictures could be color, right? But then it's like, ah. Uh, actually, they were black and white because we forgot the, the work credit card to do color copies, you know? So one of those types of things. Any little bit helps, you know? So, um, good question. Uh, when I was working in the Congo, working with indigenous communities, we were doing participatory mapping of the resource. So, um, the, the constitutions of the five countries of the Congo, DRC, CAR, Central African Republic, Democratic Republic of Congo, Gabon, Cameroon, um, this group of countries have rights enshrined in their constitutions for indigenous communities that have traditionally lived on certain lands in Congo. Now, what happens sometimes is a big Norwegian logging firm or a big Chinese mining firm is given a logging or a mining concession right over the top of these traditional held lands. So what, you know, if these tribes want to go to government and sue and say, hey, this is our traditionally held land, government will come to them and say, well, do you have a map? And they'll say no. Because <laughs> um, you know, many of the indigenous tribes that we work with um, a lot of those communities had never held a pen before. You know, these are like real forest-dwelling individuals who live in uh, these domed leaf structures. Like, you know, they really live out there. They know everything about these forests, though. Like, um, I was on a trip once in Congo. They looked at a pile of elephant dung and told me that it was a pregnant elephant. Like, just by looking at the dung pile, the, the knowledge of the natural systems out there is unparalleled. So just because you know they don't use the, the same writing utensils that we do, it's a completely next level of knowledge. In some of those cultures, they believe that rivers and streams, which we were mapping, should be depicted as red. Because if you depict a river or stream as blue, that to them symbolizes death. So we were trying to take these indigenous created maps and take them to really high level ministers in the Ministry of Mines and say, um, you, know, you need to recognize the tenure claim of this particular tribe. Now, if we bring a, a map with red lakes and red rivers to the ministry, they'll be like, this data isn't reliable. It's not a well-made map, right? So kind of reconciling the differences between you know, the map that you give to the local stakeholders that help to make the map versus the changes that you make to make it acceptable in the ministry, you, know, you really have. So your question is a good question because you really have to consider that, right? Like, you can't give a map with symbols that represent death to people that you're trying to, you know, work with, right? But you can't bring a, a map that doesn't match modern standards held by the government itself and say, hey, we want you to respect these land rights, right? Great question. All right, so. Um, one more about reefs, We're going to take one online, sorry, and then I'll bring the mic to you. Come back to you. So we have a wild card from Kelly Murphy. Will the weakening of AMOC, the Atlantic Merid, I'm not going to pronounce this correctly, meridional overturning circulation hurt any particular areas? I'm sorry to say, I don't know. I don't know much about currents, and I'm not an oceanographer. Is there an oceanographer in the room? Well, do you know the answer? Am 
Amon carries. Can you get to the microphone, please? Amon carries petawatts of energy poleward uh, to northern latitudes. So, collapse of the Amok might get colder in Norway, for example. Huh. Huh. If you've seen the movie The Day After Tomorrow, that's that's the topic of that movie. So oh, interesting. The, okay. The cli fi. Uh, cli fi. <laughs> that's super interesting. So, and again, this talk, this is like, you know, when you're working with experts in oceanography, in climate, often the changes that they're predicting at certain scales, northern hemisphere, right? If you're talking to a county commissioner in Marathon, Florida, they're like, northern hemisphere? I don't even know what you're talking about, right? Like, what's going to happen in the reef off of Marathon? So this is where, you know, this type of research goes from, like, very technical expertise at global scales, which is a matter of life or death in terms of its importance, right? And it kind of takes them down to a level where somebody maybe without a college degree can say, oh, I know exactly what you're talking about, right? So is there um, anything going on to help rejuvenate bleached uh, portions of the reefs? Yeah, um, so right now um, I have seen very small scale, like prototyped things where People have talked about like pumping cool water across a reef, and um, but these things, you know, they're just kind of in the phase where people are just kind of talking about them or simulating them. Like I've never seen, you know, a, a very kind of like at scale version of like pumping cool water across a reef. But why not in the future, right? And this is like the sort of thing that Mission Iconic Reefs is trying to fund and catalyze and scale up is these, um, you know not out there ideas, but like real genuine new ideas to respond to a problem like this quite quickly, right? And then, um, you know, the linked problem is the disease, the stony coral tissue loss, these big disease outbreaks, they tend to go hand in hand with these bleaching events, right? So I was in the Cayman Islands recently and they had come up, they don't know the, the pathogen that causes this disease, but they did come up with this uh, antibiotic paste and they did find that if they applied this paste to a bleached coral with also, unfortunately, stony coral tissue loss disease, it could kind of up its chances of not dying, right? So you had uh, Cayman Islands biologists, and I also saw this in Virgin Islands, uh, applying this paste to what they saw as these infected coral organisms. Um, again, you know, do we have an army of people to go out and put paste on the coral reefs? So again, it's like a scale issue, right? But I mean, you know, we've seen, even in my lifetime, technology has changed so much in my lifetime. I don't see these sorts of things as crazy or out there, right? Like, why not, you know? And there are people way uh, more capable than I am working on these sorts of things. So I think that we'll be able to see stuff like this one day. I'm pretty optimistic for it. It's not going to be me doing it. <laughs> All right. Well, we're coming up on time, so I will... Um wrap it up with a, uh, with an outro. But um, if you have more questions, Kelly, will you be around? Well, actually, I have one more question for you first. Um, if there are any students or, you know, youth in the audience or, you know, lifelong learners who say the work Kelly does is pretty awesome and Kelly is pretty awesome and, um, you know, what, what should I do in order to, you know, if I wanted to do similar work? Yeah, I mean, first I would try to, like, if you're a high school student, maybe coming into college, I would look at the Halb School of Natural Resources and Environment at Wyoming. We have a really interdisciplinary uh, department and uh, we have a lot of opportunities for folks to do really hands-on work. Um, we bring students out to Yellowstone National Park, to the Wind River Reservation. We work really closely with communities, uh, ranchers, fishing tour guides, Yellowstone National Park, um, uh, park service employees, um, really kind of hands-on learning experiences. Like one of the classes that I teach, for example, we go out into the National Forest and we work with National Forest uh, recreation planners to help them with their snowmobile overcrowding. So we survey people, where are you going on the snowmobile? We count snowmobiles and they use the data that we collect in a class on their winter use planning 
efforts. So really hands-on stuff. Um, can't recommend the Halb School enough. It's just a great place to learn about this sort of stuff. And you really want to try to plug into an interdisciplinary program like this. Um, and they have them you know, more and more all over. Like there's one here, I imagine. There's one at Colorado State. Um, but the Halb School is the one I'm most familiar with. And we have a lot of opportunities for young folks. And then you know, just volunteering. Like if you're looking to get a foot in the door for a service, National Park Service, um, you know, just look at the website, write to someone and say, hey, you know, I have a couple hours a week that I can come and uh, give to you, you know, just getting involved in the different, you know, say you want, you love the National Park, you want to go work in Rocky Mountain National Park one day. There's so many different careers that you can have working in national parks. You can be an ecologist, you can be an interpreter, an educator, uh, you can be somebody that works on trails, you can make parks more accessible for uh, disabled folks. Like, you, there's so many ways that you can make the park a better place but you won't know until you kind of go and volunteer and get a hands-on experience or intern. So, yeah. Yep. All right. So I wanted to say thank you um, to you all. And yes, round of applause for Kelly. Thank you to Kelly. Um, but thank you all for attending um, this talk on the intersection of climate modeling and local communities as part of our Explorer series. Um, we do hope to see you all online again on August 20th from 10 to 11 a.m. Mountain Time, where we will have our next event where we will chat with Jeanette Tillotson and Connor Scott about the derecho supercomputer that is housed in Wyoming. Um, if you're interested in more uh, about the National Science Foundation, National Center for Atmospheric Research Explorer series, please check out our website for more information about upcoming lectures and conversations and to view recordings of past events.